And we're back like we never left. Oregon fans, what's going on? How we living? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish Podcast. In case you're new here, I'm your host, Max Torres, publisher and lead editor of Ducks Digest, covering the Oregon Ducks over on Fan Nation, part of the Sports Illustrated Network. It is Monday, February 19th, 2024. Coming to you from Long Beach, California. Going to get into a little bit of Oregon football slash Oregon football recruiting. Mailbag questions where I ask you guys, the fans, the viewers, the listeners, what you want to know about and do my best to answer those questions. Um, if you want to ask a future question for a, a new, another episode, go ahead and drop it in the comments. Uh, or you can also DM me a question uh, on Twitter at M Taurus sports, that name right there on your screen. I put out a tweet asking for questions for today's episode may not get to all of them, but I'm going to do my best to uh, hop into them real quick here. So the first question for today's episode comes from Jackson Proudfoot. He asks, is there any word on Dylan Gabriel, how he's played, what the teammates think, what the coaches are saying, because I haven't seen much on him from Boise, Idaho. So thanks for the question, Jackson. Let's talk a little bit about Dylan Gabriel because I think he's obviously been one of the biggest wins for Oregon in the transfer portal of this offseason, and he fits this Will Stein offense, I think, perfectly. I'm excited to watch him because he can run, uh, because he's a lefty. I haven't really got to cover a lefty during my time covering the Ducks, and I've been covering Oregon since 2018, so it's been a long time coming. But I think Dylan Gabriel, I haven't heard anything specifically on him. Um, I mean, that right now they're just kind of in the winter workout phase. So I think it's just been a lot of uh, chemistry, building chemistry with the receivers, getting in the weight room, getting their bodies right for, for spring football, which I would think would start in early March as the spring game is set for April 27th. Uh, hoping to be in Eugene for that one, but I got I to gotta book my travel for, for that one. But because that's kind of the schedule that we're looking like, assuming that spring football is going to start around March, haven't gotten an official schedule release, but they'll usually start, go for a week or two, and then they'll have the spring break for uh, the university. And the that will give the players time to go home and, and just kind of hang out and, and be kids. And then you, they get back to Eugene and they really ramp it up through the end of uh, March throughout the month of April as well to the annual spring game. But Dylan Gabriel is someone you got to be excited about because he was one of the top quarterbacks in the country Last year at Oklahoma, he's super experienced. I think I saw that he was probably going to be on pace to break Bo Nix's uh, all-time career starts record. Um, that obviously due in part to the COVID regulations, you know, the COVID year uh, that gave people an extra season. But this is just something I was thinking about even today on Monday, just how crazy is it? I still haven't really processed the fact that Oregon landed both Dylan Gabriel from Oklahoma and Dante Moore from UCLA out of the transfer portal in the same off season. So they have their guy for this year and then they have their guy for next year. Just a super, super elite haul, probably the best quarterback haul that anybody's had. And then you also have to talk about Luke Moga from Phoenix, Arizona, Sunny Slope High School. He comes to the Ducks from the 2024 recruiting class and he's a speedster and Pretty raw as a quarterback, but man, the sky is the limit, it feels like, for him. And then you also have Austin Novosad in that room as well. So, you know, maybe not the best answer to start us off here, but I'm super stoked on Dylan Gabriel, and, and I think that there is a lot of explosive offense in store for him uh, moving forward. This next question comes from Camo Duck. I'll, maybe I can share the share my screen here so you guys can see the question. Comes from Camo Duck. If Landing lands his latest transfer portal target, just how many players are going to be are going to have to be ready to see hit the portal in spring to get us to the scholarships number from Prineville, Oregon? Yeah, so this is uh this is an interesting question. I know that the scholarship numbers have con continually been uh, a big discussion point. I want to say the latest I saw was around ninety two or or ninety three. And you got to keep in mind that the 85 is where they're looking for to get to that scholarship um, number. So I think that kind of is where our answer lies, right? Eight or nine players maybe have to be, um, you know, I think they have until the until the season starts 
to, to get down to that number. And then we have another transfer portal window that will open in April. So there's still quite a ways to go as far as just getting down to that 85 scholarship limit number. Um, and then the, the recent guy that they recently got linked to that they're reportedly pursuing in the transfer portal is Keon Sab, the Michigan safety. He signed with the Wolverines in the class of 2022 as a blue chip recruit from IMG Academy out in Florida. He only spent his senior season at IMG and he played the previous three seasons out in New Jersey where he's originally from. Pretty good year with the Wolverines. He only played four games in 2022. So 2023 is our best sample size right now. Uh, I think I was writing it up and I had like, tw he had 28 total tackles, two picks, four passes defended. Um, but he's certainly one of the biggest names in the transfer portal now, uh, seeing that he entered the portal on Friday. But you've got so many big time schools coming after Keon Sab. You have Alabama, you have Georgia. Um, as another one, Florida State, Syracuse with Fran Brown up in the Northeast. Maybe they're a, a sleeper in this one. But I think Keon Sab is really the main guy that we're keeping an eye on right now as it relates to Dan Lanning and the Ducks in the transfer portal. Um, I think that now that they have Jabbar Muhammad and they've added some other big-time guys in that secondary, Jabbar Muhammad, Cameron Alexander, Kobe Savage from Kansas State, uh, Brandon Johnson, the nickel from Duke, you already have a really, really good haul there in the secondary. And then let's not forget about the pieces that they already have coming back, uh, like Jalil Florence, Taishim Johnson. Uh, they also added a, a trio of All-Americans in the secondary in the 2024 class with Dakota Fields from Gardena Serra, Ifi Obadegwu from Baltimore, Maryland, St. Francis Academy, uh, Sione Laulea from College of San Mateo. He was a top three junior college prospect in the 2024 class. So you already have a lot of talent that you're working with. And I think that it's important not to get too caught up in the transfer portal because we know that the best teams in the country build from the high school ranks and then they move forward from that and they supplement through the transfer portal, build from high school, supplement from the portal. I think that was pretty much what Marshall Malco was saying, the Oregon chief of staff when he was on the uh, Oregon sports network, the coaches show more or less during the uh, February, early signing period, uh, February signing period earlier this month. So I think the Keon Sab would be a huge addition. I don't think he's a huge, huge need, but I think he would certainly upgrade that secondary for the ducks. But seeing that he just entered the portal, I think you're probably going to have a little bit of time between now and when he decides uh, we're kind of in the Michigan portal window right now with Jim Harbaugh taking that job with the Los Angeles chargers to hopefully uh, get Justin Herbert back on the right track. But that is the latest question from Camo Duck. Appreciate the question. This one comes from another longtime listener. We got Matt Kinoshita. Uh, hopefully I, I'm saying these names right. Um, this one's a little bit of a different question, not super, super uh, organ related, but Matt asks, since you're in Long Beach slash California, what's the vibe like for USC on the local trails? How have their new hires been received by recruits? Is it hyped up or skepticism? Should Duck fans be concerned? So I, I like this question. I mean, given that I'm in Southern California, I think it's one that is um, certainly relevant, right? I think that USC hasn't done a phenomenal job recruiting locally, and they've really kind of become, in, in my eyes, a portal school under Lincoln Riley. Uh, that being a school that prioritizes the transfer portal more than the high school ranks. Um, but maybe maybe Lincoln Riley, I think he's working to change that a little bit in the 2024 class um, and then moving, of course, on to the 2025 cycle now. So I think that the vibe has been pretty strong for, for USC um, with, with the local recruits. Um, I mean, I also get a good mix of national guys because a lot of these seven-on-seven -seven tournaments bring in teams like the Trillium Boys, uh, Premium, seven on seven. Um, you also have uh, California power. They're one of the best in the country. I saw them a couple of weeks ago and like their entire team went out to visit uh, USC. So I think USC is like Oregon in a lot of ways, as far as they have that strong brand that is going to be recognizable anywhere in the country. And I think that that's obviously going to give them a strong basis for recruiting, but I think they're making all the right moves as far as the hires that they're bringing in. I mean, they completely overhauled that uh, defensive coaching staff 
after they got rid of Alex Grinch. So I think that um, their their D line coach uh, is one that is I think making a lot of waves um, following his hire. Um, I'm trying to see who because they have they have Sean Nua, but they they just hired is it Henderson? Um, Eric Henderson. He's the new defensive coordinator slash run game coordinator slash defensive line coach. Um, so he has really been a pretty big hit. I think he's the guy I see, like I think generating the most buzz um, as their new D line coach since being hired. Um, you know, he, he's worked with a lot of really good players. I think the most notable one is probably Aaron Donald. Um, let's see here. Yeah, because he, he spent time with uh, the Rams as their defensive line coach. So the fact that he's going, that Lincoln Riley is going to the NFL ranks, that's that's what a lot of players want, right? They want to be developed and get to that next level. So I think Henderson has been uh, a really big hire for them. I think that, uh, I don't know if I'd say, I would say it's hyped up, but that's kind of what I would expect it to be because you're starting to see them. I think that they're not making a huge wave uh, as far as... Um, commitments go here in the 2025 class julian lewis is their only commit right now he's the quarterback out of Carrollton, georgia um he reclassed from 26 to 25 and i don't think he's going to end up at usc you're seeing a lot of other schools georgia uh indiana uh recently hopping in the mix there but i wouldn't say that duck fans should be concerned um because even though usc has had one really good season under lincoln riley i don't think they've been recruiting that there's pretty there's a pretty clear gap or a pretty clear divide, should I say, between Lincoln Riley and USC and Dan Lanning and Oregon. So you're not really seeing Oregon losing recruiting battles to USC on the on the trail. So I don't think that Oregon fans should be concerned. But for my money, I think that Lincoln Riley is making the right moves, gutting that defensive staff and just saying that, hey, we're going to put a new emphasis on defense. And now we just have to see what they can ultimately produce on the field in 2025. But USC has got the brand. They've got the location. Um, they certainly have a lot of tradition uh, in, in their corner. So uh, I don't think Duck fans should be concerned, but USC is doing what they can to turn things around on the recruiting trail. No doubt about it. All right, let's see here. Take a little sip of coffee here on a Friday afternoon. Next question comes to us from Mitchell Reed. Uh, Mitchell says, Max, let's see a more in-depth analysis of two things, a tight end room and the Ducks offensive playbook for 2024. Let's go Duckies, Mitchell from Bend. Thank you for the question, Mitchell. You've been a longtime listener, so always glad to see you interacting with the mailbag. So let's talk about this tight end room for Oregon. I think that it's going to be one of the better tight end rooms that we've seen in a while. You're, you obviously start things off with Terrence Ferguson, who – I think probably would have gotten drafted this year had he went to the NFL draft. I don't know how highly he would have been drafted, but I think he's really put together a, a solid body of work during his time at Oregon. And he gives the Ducks room under Drew Merringer uh, a ton of momentum going into this this uh, senior year. 6'5", 255 pounds, um, and he has really been the the cornerstone of of Oregon's passing attack as far as tight ends go. I think he can do a lot of different things. You can move him around a little bit. He's been a really good blocker, which I think was something that I was a little bit skeptical about coming into his college career, seeing that he was more of a pass catching tight end, I think in Colorado as a high school guy than uh, a, a blocker, but he's done a phenomenal job during his time at Oregon. I think pairing him with, with Patrick Herber is, is really going to help the ducks. Wasn't incredibly, you know, I'm not going to say he wasn't incredibly effective, but he didn't you know, put up a ton of stats last year, 42 catches for 414 yards and six touchdowns. Um, I think that he was really, I think he led the team or he was number two on the team in 2022 uh, in touchdowns, but he was definitely a top target for Bo Nix. And I think pairing him with Patrick Herbert, Patrick Herbert finally has a, a full healthy season under his belt. So he's got some momentum. And I think he showed this past season that he can make some noise after the catch as well. Um, and then you have Kenyon Sadiq, uh, the the uh, you know young uh, underclassman from Idaho, and <clears throat> I think Kenyon Sadiq is a guy I'm super excited about because he's just super athletic and he's got really good speed, probably the fastest tight end in that room. Uh, I liked how they got him involved as a true freshman. You know, some pop passes, some sweeps, 
Um, and I think he's a, he's got a real potential as a playmaking tight end. So um, get, definitely give me some of the Kenyon Sadiq's stock if, if I can, if I can get it. He saw a little bit of shakeup in this room with Casey Kelly hitting the portal again. He started at Ole Miss, came to Oregon for a year, and then now he's going to East Carolina. Uh, just really wasn't a big part of the Oregon offense, although he did have a touchdown. I want to say it was against Colorado. Um, but this this roster welcomed two more tight ends from the 2024 class in uh, Roger Saliapaga and uh, A.J. Pugliano. A.J. Pugliano was a top, a top in-state guy. Um, so seeing him added for uh, the 2024 recruiting class, I think he, he was the first commit for the Ducks in the 2024 class. So it's important to keep those top guys home within your state. I also really like Jaden Fortier um, out of Tualatin. He ended up at Arizona State, but A.J. Pugliano is a guy that I think has some, some solid upside. I'm really excited about Roger Saliapaga just because he was kind of like Tifer. He was a, a playmaking, pass-catching tight end. I see some similarities in their game coming out of the state of Utah. Um, you know, really big body for a tight end, you know, six foot five, six foot four, 215, 220 pounds. The state of Utah has been really, really good to Oregon uh, in recent years. You know, obviously getting the Sewell brothers out of there, getting Jackson Powers Johnson, who, who might be a first round of the NFL draft selection. And then um, you're also looking at uh, Jeffrey Bossa. I don't know if I already mentioned him. So, uh, Dan Landing and the Ducks are, are very keen on talent from the state of Utah, and I think they're going to continue to recruit the heck out of it moving forward. Um, you also have uh, Bear Tenney as a 2025 tight end out of Lehigh, Utah, that is really high on the Ducks. So you've seen some more recent recruiting efforts there. Um, I could go on, but those are kind of just some of the ones to that come to mind. Um, and then Mitchell's other part here, he said the the offensive playbook for 2024. I think that that uh, there's not a lot of specifics that I can get into right now. Um, you know, just have, I'm not really doing like an in-depth film study on this, but I think Will Stein wants to keep doing what worked well with, uh, with Bo Nix and, uh, try to see what, what works well for Dylan Gabriel, because there's stuff that Bo Nix did really well that maybe Dylan Gabriel doesn't do quite as well. Or maybe there's stuff that Dylan Gabriel is doing that he's better at than Bo Nix. There, there's going to be some carryover and some crossover, but also some differences, um, I'm curious to see how much, if at all, the playbook changes uh, because Dylan Gabriel is a left-handed quarterback. Again, that's just a different wrinkle that could maybe, um, you know, cause the Ducks to, to change a little bit, but I don't see it changing things dramatically. Um, I want to say that um, you um, was Frank Harris a lefty at, at UTSA? Um, I don't think he was. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Because he was a really good quarterback for the Roadrunners. He was a lefty. Okay, so Will Stein has worked with left-handed quarterbacks before. Uh, Frank Harris, the UTSA quarterback, uh, he is he's a left-handed quarterback. So he's got some experience there. This isn't going to be the first time that Will Stein's worked with a lefty. Um, I wonder how Dylan Gabriel compares to Bo Nix as a runner. Um, maybe he's a little bit faster, but they, they really do have a lot of similarities in their game. And I feel like that's probably part of the reason that uh, – Will Stein wanted him to be a top target for the Ducks. So I'm excited to see how the playbook changes, but a lot of this kind of just, you know, you know, if it's, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And I think the Ducks have been fortunate to have some really good consistency and carryover with their staff. Um, Junior Adams is back. Drew Merringer is back. Carlos Lachlan's back. Uh, Alik Terry is back. So you have a lot of, uh, you know, those same pieces from the last season. They're going to help you carry over to hopefully have a, a strong season in 2024 as well. Let's see what we got here. All right. This next question comes from Aaron Martinez on Twitter. How many wideouts are we looking to take in the 2025 class since we're in a good spot for a lot of elite talent? Hashtag Ducks Dish. Yeah, thank you for using the hashtag there, Aaron. I appreciate it. Oregon has two wide receivers committed in the 2025 class with Dallas Wilson out of Tampa Bay Tech as well as Adrian Wilson from Pflugerville, Texas, Weiss High School. Those are going to be, those are already two really high profile guys, two blue chippers. Dallas Wilson's at number 53 on the 247 Sports Composite, and Adrian Wilson's at the number 144 spot on the 247 Sports Composite. So there's still a lot of big time schools that are uh, in the mix for those guys, but 
if you're looking at other wide receivers, I know you mentioned that uh, Oregon's in a really good spot with a lot of them. Let's just get some some uh, some of the fans, some of the listeners up to speed in case they're not following it super, super closely. DeCorian Moore is one I've talked about quite a bit on, on this YouTube channel. Uh, he's a five-star wide receiver committed to LSU out of Duncanville, Texas. Um, would not be surprised if he ended up at Oregon. I'm not making a prediction there, but I just know Oregon has done a ton of work behind the scenes on that one. You also have Isaiah Mosey out of Lee Summit North High School in Missouri, Dan Lanning's home state. I know he's one that I really think Oregon could have a good shot with seeing that uh, Dan Lanning and his dad uh, have been longtime friends. So obviously it's all about relationships and connections and and with those guys in Missouri, man, you got to keep an eye on uh, Dan Lanning because he's from there. So I think that those recruits might mean a little bit more uh, if you can dominate in your home state, your home area, similar to what I've talked about with Tosh Lapoy and new Oregon edge rush commit, Matthew Johnson out of De La Salle. That's the same high school that, that uh, Tosh Lapoy went to. So I think when you get those guys on your board, you're going to try to land them. But um, that those are two more guys. And then you also have Marcus Harris out of Santa Ana Modern Day. He loves Oregon. Cooper Perry out of Notre Dame Prep in Scottsdale, Arizona. I have my prediction down for Oregon. I think you're probably going to go four or five wide receivers because look at all the guys that you have on the roster right now for 2025, 2024. You have Tez Johnson. He'll be gone after this year. Gary Bryant. He'll be gone after this year. Treshawn Holden. He'll be gone after this year. Evan Stewart could possibly be gone after 2024, seeing that he's already got two seasons under his belt. So I think, and then you have guys like Jurion Dickey and Kyler Casper that are kind of waiting in the wings. Hopefully we see more of them this year. I think you have to look at this roster. You've got to keep recruiting for the future, right? You can't just just recruit for 2025. Um, but that being said, because you're losing a lot of those projected starters, I think you're probably going to go for another four or five wide receivers and then maybe they'll try to get a guy in the portal as well. So there's a lot of really good guys that they're in a good spot with, like Aaron says in this question. So I'd say probably another full wide receiver hall, four or five guys. It's a premium position. You can never have too many playmakers. Um, so I think they're going to continue to be really, really active there at the wide receiver spot. I think there might have been another question um, about the wide receivers. So we'll we'll make sure to hit some of those. Um this next question comes from Sports Takes at NFL Takes 99462 on Twitter. Question is, is there any quarterbacks we're looking at for the class of 2026? And what's the update on Derek Meadows and Jordan Davison? Yeah, let's look at Oregon football's offers in the 2026 class. I'm sure there's a quarterback I can talk about. I know there's one that I'm really excited about that you guys have to know about, um, you know, as far as West Coast guys go. Let me talk about him here. Ryder Lyons. I think Ryder Lyons is certainly a guy you got to keep an eye on here. I'll get back to the question in just a second. But Ryder Lyons is someone that you got to know about. He plays at Folsom High School in Northern California, and he's not ranked on the 2026. Right now, 247 only has the top 100 guys, I want to say, in 2026. But this guy is getting every offer you can imagine. He has 25 reported scholarship offers to his name. And you have Texas A&M, I believe, is the latest one. Oregon is there. Well, Stein has gone out to see him throw. Um, so he's listed at 6'2", 205 pounds. But this is a really creative passer. Um, plays for one of the best programs in the state of California. Um, they, they won a state title this year. Uh, I can't remember who they played, but I know that they won a state title this year uh, in California. So Ryder Lyons is certainly one to watch. He's been to Oregon before, as far as I know. Um, but he's someone I definitely want to interview coming up here in the in the 2026 class. So Ryder Lyons would be one that you got to watch, especially because he's a top West Coast guy. I think with Achilles Smith Jr. Um, in the fold in 2025 out of San Diego, Oregon's going to try to get get those top West Coast guys continuing, you know, get those get them back to Oregon because a lot of them have been leaving the the West Coast to play their football elsewhere. How about Brady Smigel? He's another one that I would uh, say Oregon fans should know about, um, you know, here in the 2026 recruiting class. I think he's worth a mention. He's a five-star. I've been running a couple updates on him uh, over on DucksDigest.com. He's at a Newberry Park, California, SoCal, listed at 6'5", 205 pounds, 28 reported scholarship offers. A couple of recent visits include Oregon, Notre Dame, and UCLA, uh, but that happened right before uh, Chip Kelly took the OC job at Ohio State. So 
Um, you know, new new head coach Deshaun Foster is going to try to get some of these local guys back to UCLA. I think they have a lot of work to do as a recruiting power um, moving to the Big Ten. But I think that he's another guy you got to look at in the 2026 recruiting class. And then, man, how about another big name? How about Jared Curtis out of Nashville, uh, Nashville Christian School? He's a five star number one player in the entire country for 2026. I uh, got 34 reported scholarship offers to his name, but he was recently in Eugene for a visit. I mean, I told you guys the caliber of talent coming through Eugene for June, those two junior day uh, events was insane. And Jared Curtis made his way out to Eugene. So really important again, I think just to show to, to hit on Oregon and this staff recruiting two classes at the same time, 2025 and 2026. And then even looking ahead to 2027, those guys that are going to be starting their sophomore seasons, this fall in high school, but Jared Curtis is one is you don't, the names don't get any bigger than him. And it looks like Steve Bolt Fong of two, four, seven sports has Georgia tapped as an early leader. there. not a huge surprise seeing that they've been playing some incredible football. And Jared Curtis is located in the Southeast in Tennessee. So that's the reason that we're talking about him. So those are some guys to keep an eye on. And then back to the rest of this question, Derek Meadows and Jordan Davison, Talked so much at length about Jordan Davison, so I don't want to spend too much time on him, but he's a top 2025 running back target for the Ducks out of Santa Ana, California, modern day high school. I think Oregon is no worse than number two in that recruitment. You got Texas, Oregon, Ohio State, Alabama, all these heavy hitters that are in the mix. But with uh, Carlos Lachlan and the Ducks missing out on Nate Frazier, the 2024 running back out of modern day who went to Georgia. I think that they are more determined than ever to get Jordan Davis in 2025, and I love their chances. Derek Meadows, though, he is a newer name that we are tracking in the 2025 recruiting class for Oregon. He's a six foot five, 200 pound wide receiver out of Bishop Gorman in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, it looks like the, some of the recruiting experts at 247, Tom Loy, have Notre Dame pegged as the early leader there. He's just popping off on the recruiting trail right now. 22 reported scholarship offers. I think Oregon has a chance to probably get a visit in the near future, seeing that they uh, offered him recently and he's been tearing things up on the seven on seven circuit. They've done good work at a uh, Bishop Gorman before they signed Cody to Canberra in the 2023 recruiting class as a top safety nationally. So they have some momentum at that play at that school. Uh, he is technically a West coast guy, right? Las Vegas. That's West coast, pretty much Western region. Um, and we know that junior Adams likes to kind of stick to, he doesn't, he doesn't stick to the West Coast entirely, but that's kind of his sweet spot, right? Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if Oregon became a contender for Derek Meadows. So keep an eye on him. I think he's one of the more intriguing recruits that Oregon recently offered here in the 2025 recruiting class. Got a couple more questions I want to get to for, for you guys. Um, so if you haven't already, do me a favor, like the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. We're growing the community here on YouTube. And um, I love doing this. For you guys, the fans, and uh, you know, subscribing is a quick and easy way to show your support. So, next question for us today in the pod comes from H. Reardon, 1984. With all of Oregon's recent recruiting success, why don't we see five-star players from 247's composite rankings commit early to us? Over half are already committed, and it seems like we never get top players in the class to commit until late in the cycle. Question comes from Gilbert, Arizona. Love your podcast. Appreciate the appreciate the question uh, from Hank Reardon. It looks like is is the name Hank. I think with with Oregon. So let me let me pull up the uh, the top two four seven um, recruits right now. Okay, uh, I want to just get these guys. Where do we go here? Um, twenty twenty five two four seven composite. Here we go. So let me pull this up for you here. Get this on the screen. All right, so here we have the 247 Sports Top Football Recruits. If you're looking at us on YouTube, uh, yeah, you have, a, I mean, six of the top six players, six of the top players in the country are already committed. Two of them are to LSU. Bryce Underwood, the number one quarterback out of Belleville, Michigan. He's committed to LSU. And then Decorian Moore out of Duncanville, Texas, who I talked about. He's also committed to LSU. And then you see some early blue chippers. Devin Sanchez, the cornerback out of North Shore in Houston. And then Naeem offered out of Birmingham, Alabama, both committed to Ohio State. But look at these guys that Oregon's in the mix for. DeCorian Moore, who I've already talked about. DJ Pickett out of uh, Zephyr Hills in Tampa, Florida. Um, 
we can keep going here and find some other guys. Josh Petty is a big-time offensive tackle out of Roswell, Georgia, that I know Oregon's involved with. Uh, Dorian Brew, there's been some Oregon link there. Fahim Delaney out of Olney, Maryland. Um, I think I've also seen just, uh, sorry, um, Eose Epinesa, younger brother of, um, oh man, what was that other guy's name? Uh, Epinesa, Iowa, what was his name? Uh, AJ Epinesa. He was a big time defensive end that rolled through Iowa as well. I, so that's another guy that I think Oregon's been involved with. Andrew Babalola out of Kansas, Jonah Williams. So I could go on and on. It doesn't help me to tell you guys all of these players that Oregon's involved with, but I just think it's kind of how Oregon recruits. It's kind of their strategy. I mean, look at some of these blue chippers that they got at the end of the 24 cycle. Gatlin Bear, Ryan Pelham, Jeremiah McClellan. I think I think it just has to do with the fact that they, you know, they they play the long game with with recruits. I think that they're not deterred if someone like a Decorian Moore is committed to uh, you know, a blue blood or a, you know, a national power and they're going to keep it going. And I think it's just they don't they don't put pressure on guys to I'm not saying these other schools do, but they don't put pressure on guys to commit early. Um, I think that they would much rather get a guy to commit later and have him stick with that commitment than commit early, take a bunch of other visits. And I don't think Oregon doesn't have that recruiting policy that some other schools, I think, do. They they let commits take other visits. It's not a deal breaker. I think that they just, you know, they let the relationships win out, and sometimes that just takes a little bit longer. Um, so I, I do understand the premise of the question uh, here from Hank, just, you know, not getting guys until late in the cycle, but I don't really think it matters. As long as you get those guys in the fold, that's what matters. And then looking into 2026, they got uh, Tony Cumberland, who's a five-star um, on 247 out of Arizona. It looks like he's going to reclass to 2025, so maybe they buck that trend a little bit. But it doesn't really matter if you don't get top guys until late in the cycle, as long as you get them. So, um, you know, I don't know if that's too blunt of an answer, but I, I do understand the premise of the question, and I have seen that, uh, you know, over the years covering the Ducks. I think I have a couple more. We'll do two more um, here. This one comes from Andrew Montgomery. Which position groups do you anticipate we'll see departures from after the spring game to get the Ducks down to the scholarship max coming from Oregon City, Oregon? Shout out to Oregon City. Some of my best friends are from Oregon City. We got Jacob Breck and Dev. Not, not sure they're listening to the pod, but shout out if they are. So I think... I think you could probably see some of the secondary getting reshifted a little bit um, just because they've they've uh, taken so many players at that position. I think that, um, you know, it's just interesting to kind of look at the um, the window. It's kind of like if you haven't done something in your first two years within that system, uh, maybe you'll see guys transfer out. So I'm, I, don't, I don't like to speculate too much on transfers because you can kind of step on people's toes and it can get kind of messy. but. I think that, uh, you know, it's a good way to, I don't want to talk about specific players. So I think the secondary, you can maybe see some guys moving around, um, maybe wide receiver, just because those are two position groups that they have a ton of bodies at and guys just haven't necessarily carved out a role that have been here for around two years. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Maybe a little bit of defensive line because they've taken so many guys at D line, but you also need a lot of bodies along the defensive line. So I think those are probably the two position groups that I would keep an eye on. Um, you know, if, if you're looking at groups that, that maybe could see some movement, but we got to see how spring football plays out and, and you know, what goes on there. Last question for today is a good one. This one from T cheesy T Chessy T cheesy is the sentiment from the 2025 class of recruits more or less excited slash impressed overall about Oregon than the 2024 class. I live in Portland. Uh, I'd say it's probably more excited. I think just the fact that Dan Lanning is staying in Eugene and you have long-term stability at the top of your program, I think that really has helped the Ducks when it comes to their recruiting efforts on the trail, You know, having that stability. And even if Dan Lanning didn't get offered the Alabama job, a lot of people are taking it that way. Um, I don't think we know for sure whether or not he did get offered the Alabama job, but we know he was at least heavily in the mix or a name that they were monitoring. So the fact that he is staying in Eugene, I think that could be the separator. 
I really do. And it's crazy to say that because the Ducks just got their best recruiting class in the country or in program history. I think it was number four, the first time they've ever inked a top five class. But I was talking with my guy, Spencer McLaughlin, and I think top five is kind of, I think top 10 is the floor, the recruiting floor for the Ducks. But if they keep pushing the right buttons, doing the right things, having success on the field, which I think they're going to, they're going to be one of the better teams in the Big Ten this year. They're going to continue to ascend those recruiting rankings. And I think that we could see them continue year after year to continue to push the envelope and sign those top, top recruiting classes. So I think that Oregon is is probably, you know, they got recruits more excited and impressed overall than in the 2024 class, as crazy as that sounds. But that's going to do it for me on this Oregon football slash recruiting Monday mailbag. A big thank you to you guys tuning in, whether you're on podcast or YouTube. Make sure to tap in with me on social media. I am at mTorres Sports on both Twitter, formerly known as at, or X, formerly known as Twitter. Maybe this is my big moment. Follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram at mTorres Sports. Subscribe to my YouTube channel at Oregon Football Max Torres. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you're thinking about Oregon football. Read me at ducksdigest.com and share the show, share the Ducks Dish podcast with your friends, with your family, and with other Duck fans. But until next time, you've been tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Ducks Dish podcast.